Yeah. And I mean, you know, teenagers in particular, young people, but I guess adults as well, kids. And this is a real problem because then, you know, not only do we know that processed food is bad for you and it's full of sugar and full of bad fats, it's very low in fiber, but on top of that, it's addictive. And so that makes it very complicated. So we know that we have to eat real food and that we should avoid sugar, eat fiber. That's sort of the bottom line. But then a lot of people are wondering, you know, what should we eat? I mean, we're bombarded with so much information. You know, first it's the keto fad, then it's vegan saying, you know, meat is terrible. And you've got things like the China study, which say, you know, cancer rates go up when you eat meat. Um, You've got the paleo, uh, you've got, you know, all these different diets. Now, from your research, and you know, you've done a lot of it, apart from this really sort of what's become sort of a holy grail or Bible, which is, you know, protect your liver, feed your gut, that those are the key presets. But which diet does that best? The short answer is, it depends on you. It depends, number one, on your personal biochemistry which you now can learn. There are ways to find out. Continuous glucose monitoring can tell you a lot. Okay, so, uh, there are some genetic tests that can actually tell you a lot. Microbiome tests are starting to come into their own to tell you a lot. Ultimately, all of this information right now is data. We have to turn it into usable information, but we're in the process of doing that. So my expectation is that within the next three to five years, there will be an algorithm for being able to determine your personal biochemical profile, which will then tell you what foods are the best ones for you to eat for your own personal health. Having said that, today, that's not quite there. We do have continuous glucose monitoring that is available. And full disclosure, I am an advisor to several companies that use continuous glucose monitoring information to try to alter people's uh, eating patterns and people's diets in an attempt to try to improve health. We have not yet shown that it actually is, causes life extension, but we have good data on being able to actually mitigate the glucose and therefore the insulin spikes because those insulin spikes cause cellular damage that metabolic health problem we talked about earlier, okay, is because of high levels of insulin. So keeping your insulin down is job one for any diet, but you don't know which foods will keep your insulin down unless you have some metric, some biomarker for figuring it out. Currently, glucose monitoring exists. Now, is that enough? Not even close, but it's a start. Okay. It's the first thing out of the gate, right? Ultimately, we're going to need ketone monitoring. We're going to need lactate monitoring. We're going to need alcohol monitoring. We're going to need insulin monitoring. And that's going to be the big one. And uh, that unfortunately is about five years away. Okay. We're also going to need postprandial triglyceride monitoring. All right. That's going to be even longer down the pike, but. And you're against it. And uric acid, and well, uric acid is here now. Yeah. Uh, so that, that that's, but it doesn't have to be in real time. You just have to know what your uric acid is. It's not something that changes on a minute to minute basis, but the others do. Mm-hmm. So the point is that there's information to be had and we are learning how to harness that information. And that will tell us which diet is best for which person. Mm-hmm. But in the meantime, Until that's a real thing, and it's not a real thing yet, until that's a real thing, there are certain precepts that we know do work. One is get the insulin down any way you can. You want a low insulin diet. Now, there are two basic ways to have a low insulin diet. One is don't make the insulin go up. Well, what makes the insulin go up? Refined carbohydrate and sugar. So we would call that a low carb diet. Okay. But it has to be a really low carb diet. Most people who go on a low carb diet are not going on a low carb diet. They are going on a medium carb diet and they're still making, you know, their glucose rise and they're still making their insulin rise. 
So the concept that you can be on a 35% carbohydrate diet and call that low carb is a joke. Mm -hmm. If you're really on a low carb diet, you better be below 25% carbohydrate. How can you determine that? Well, you have to know your ketones, all right? Is there a way to know your ketones? Well, actually there is now, there's a breath ketone meter that's available or a urine, you know, you can ch check your urine for ketones. But the bottom line is if you are, if you think you're on a ketogenic diet and you're not, you know, because you're, you're, you're eating more carbohydrate than you should, then you're on the worst diet. You're on a high fat, medium carbohydrate diet, which is the single worst diet possible. So, either go whole hog or don't. So that's one way. The second way is what the vegans do. Now, I'm not against veganism. I'm not for veganism. I'm not against ketogenic diets. I'm not for ketogenic diets. What I'm for is getting the insulin down. That's what I'm for. <clears throat> so people say, oh, Lustig, he's low carb. Not true. Oh, Lustig, he's anti-vegan. Not true. Okay. What I am is for real food. So why is real food okay? Why does real food get your insulin down? Well, because real food has fiber. And fiber, by blocking that early absorption, is keeping that glucose and insulin rise in check. And if you look at the data in the literature, it turns out a high fiber diet will do as good a job at suppressing that glucose and insulin spike as a low carb diet will. So in fact, the vegans and the ketos are actually on the same page, okay? They think they're actually antagonists to each other. They need to actually band together and um, attack the, the real culprit, which is processed food, because that's the thing that never works. That's the thing that our bodies can't handle. And the reason is because that's the thing that makes your glucose and your insulin go highest. And that's the thing that causes mitochondrial dysfunction. And that's the thing that ultimately leads to chronic metabolic disease. So for instance, you know, you mentioned in your book that the US rate of diabetes is 9.4% of the population versus in India, which is 8.8% of the population. And yet in India, you know, they don't eat beef, for instance. You also mentioned that in Argentina and New Zealand, we, they eat twice as much meat per capita as in the US, and yet they have much lower rates of cancer, heart disease, and diabetes. Right. So in some ways, you've, you know, you've very much shown from those statistics, I think that, you know, it's not the meat that's the issue. It's more the processed food or the carbohydrates that are around that. Is that correct? So in, in my book, there's a, a, a figure and I took it. Uh, it's a photo that I took in a Rome restaurant window uh, back in 2016. And I love this photo. It, it, show, it, it shows uh, Italian beef on the top, then Argentinian beef in the middle, and finally U.S. grade A prime, you know, corn-fed beef on the bottom. And what you can see is that the Italian beef and the Argentinian beef are nice and pink, red, and homogeneous all the way through. And then you look at the U.S. beef and you see all this marbling. Now, in America, we prize our beef on the marbling. We sell it all over the world because you can cut it with a butter knife because of the marbling. Well, that marbling is intramyocellular lipid. That marbling is fat in the muscle. That animal has metabolic syndrome because it got fed corn. The Italian beef, the Argentinian beef, they didn't get fed, fed corn. what they feed on? They fed on grass. Okay. They don't lay down fat in their muscle because they are not sick. Mm -hmm. Okay. It also takes 18 months for a cow in Argentina to go from birth to slaughter. Whereas it only takes six months in America for a cow to go from birth to slaughter. And the reason is because we fatten them up. We give those animals metabolic syndrome on purpose to fatten them up because number one, the meat is, you know, uh, tastier and because of the fat, uh, well, or, but it's actually not tastier. It's, it's just a little easier to cut and also for cash flow. 
because you know we can move the, the cows through through the the system faster so in fact the italian beef and the argentinian beef are way healthier yeah. than american beef now american uh, cows are fed on what we call concentrated animal feeding operations or CAFOs. Okay. There's no pasture. There's no grass. There's no food that isn't brought in. And what do they bring in? They bring in corn. And because they bring in corn, they are nutrient deficient. And because they're nutrient deficient, they get sick. They get infections easily. So what do the uh, ranchers have to do? They have to inject them with antibiotics. And so there are antibiotics all throughout the meat, right? And that allows them to be able to grow faster because you've sterilized their microbiome, which actually causes chronic metabolic disease, inflammation, and more fat deposition. So in fact, the way we process cows in America actually leads to the problem. And then on top of that, when you um, kill off the microbiome, the methanogens, the methane producing bacteria, they don't get killed off by those standard antibiotics. They end up populating the entire intestine of the cow. And so cows today in America produce five times the methane than they used to back in 1968. So everybody says, let's get rid of the cows because of climate change. In fact, all we'd have to do is get rid of the antibiotics, but we can't get rid of the antibiotics until we get rid of the CAFO. Right. But that means, again, real food. It always comes back to real food, any which way you cut it. Understood. And it's also, you know, the quality of that real food, essentially. So how the meat is fed is very important. Mm -hmm. There's another thing that you raise in your book, which I found fascinating, which is, you know, processing isn't simply what's done by industry. It's also what we do at home when we cook our food. Mm -hmm. And you raise a lot of issues around the way we cook our food and how we can turn good real food into very toxic, poisonous food for ourselves, whether it's by overheating olive oil, for instance, or creating, you know, ages and, and when we cook our vegetables or our meat and charcoal and all these sort of carcinogenic compounds. Can you talk us through that? Because essentially when we cook things, we're processing them ourselves and that has huge nefarious consequences. Right. So the watchword of the, of the book is it's not what's in the food. It's what's been done to the food that matters. And what's been done to the food can have been done by the food industry, or it can have been done to the food by ourselves, mm -hmm. right? So we process food at home too, when we cook it, or when we juice it, right? So the easiest, simplest, uh, you know, food processing technique at home that causes problems is juicing a fruit, right? So we end up taking the fiber and throwing it in the garbage, like we talked about before. Well, people say, oh, but I'm not uh, throwing the fiber away. I'm putting it in the smoothie machine. I'm putting it in the, you know, Breville or the Vitamix or the Nutribullet. Well, the fact of the matter is what you are doing is you are shearing the insoluble fiber to smithereens. Now, there are two kinds of fiber in fruit. There's soluble fiber like pectins or inulin, like what holds jelly together they're globular, and there's insoluble fiber, like cellulose, or chitins, like soft shell crab, you know, the outside of the soft shell crab. Okay, those are insoluble fiber. You need both, you need both. Why do you need both? Because the insoluble fiber will form a lattice work, like a fishnet, on the inside of the intestine. The soluble fiber will, because they're globular, will plug the holes in the fishnet, and you get this barrier. And this barrier then protects the liver and ultimately feeds the gut. So that being able to form that barrier is essential. But as soon as you take the orange and throw it into the you know, Vitamix, okay, the blades of the Vitamix are going to shear that insoluble fiber, that cellulose into smithereens. You can't make a fishnet. It'd be like taking a million scissors and cutting a fishnet up into you know, little pieces. Okay, it's not gonna catch fish anymore. Right? Same thing happens in your intestine. As soon as you macerate that fiber so completely in a juicing machine, okay, it's not there anymore. 
the molecules are there, but the function has been destroyed. All right. So that's the simple, you know, the easy concept of how you can destroy food at home. Another one is French fries. All right. So French fries are carbohydrate, right? Potatoes, carbohydrate, okay, in oil, except that when you heat oil high enough, okay, what it does is it, uh, it, uh, it uh, binds to the carbohydrate and increases a uh, compound called acrylamide. And acrylamide has been shown to be a class A carcinogen. Another example is charcoal grilling. So charcoal grilling, I love charcoal grilling. <laughs> I'm kind of a semi-expert uh, and you know this, this pains me to no end. Um, but the fact of the matter is when you charcoal grill meat, you are creating aryl hydrocarbons, which bind to the aryl hydrocarbon receptor in the liver and can either cause obesity or can actually cause um, uh, cancer, All right? And so there are various maneuvers uh, that we do to food. Uh, olive oil, as you mentioned, or polyunsaturated oils, they, 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 they have double bonds, okay? As opposed to saturated fat, which doesn't, like lard, okay? Does not have double bonds. Well, the double bonds are all cis double bonds, all right? And cis double bonds are okay, and we can break those down. We have the enzymes to break those down. But when you heat a, a double bond oil, so olive oil or canola oil or soybean oil or any of these oils, okay, when you heat them super hot, which tend, people tend to do when they're frying, okay, you can put enough energy across that double bond so that the double bond will flip. And so instead of a cis double bond, now you've got a trans double bond. You have created a trans fat. And we know that trans fats are the worst fats because we don't have the enzyme to cleave that double bond. And so it ends up lining our livers and our arteries and causing chronic metabolic disease as well. So cooking techniques can ultimately lead to turning what was medicine into poison. So the key really is, you know, to, would you say then is raw food better? I mean, I know Vitamix, you can do vegetable smoothies and that's not great either, but so would you advocate for a raw food diet or would you just say use different oils that have a higher smoke point? So there's no question that raw food has, you know, you have not uh, altered uh, the, you know, the chemical structure of the food in any meaningful way. And so it will have, um, shall we say, uh, better uh, uh, absorption and um, uh, uh, glucose excursion kinetics in the body. That is true. Having said that, there are some things that you do to food when you cook it that actually liberates some of the micronutrients. So, you know, like for instance, B12, et cetera. So there's, there are things that you actually can and should do to food to be, be able to uh, access uh, many of the micronutrients. So no, I'm not specifically advocating for raw food. People who eat raw food do fine, and I'm not saying that there's a problem. However, there are certain things where actually cooking is appropriate. Like for instance, you know, eggs, I mean, raw eggs, you know, worry about salmonella, um, you know, uh, uh, raw spinach, you know, sometimes E. coli, especially, you know, you know, when the FDA is not looking, um, et cetera. So there, there are advantages to uh, cooking that um, uh, get rid of some of the uh, bacterial uh, toxins and uh, contaminants that can cause, you know, uh, 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 food, uh, foodborne uh, illness outbreaks. And also raw food tends to be less digestible and cooked food can be more digestible and less of a strain on your digestive system. Now, before we get so, to questions- So it ends, up being, it ends up being a balance. You know, we're, we're walking the tightrope. So it's not like you should just eat raw food or you should just eat cooked food. You know, it, it, ultimately there's a balance to be, to be struck here. Absolutely.